Hello, this is the lecture on how to be safe in these times of COVID with a particular emphasis on social distancing. First off, a reminder to make sure that we understand where we're coming from. Just as you look up into the night sky and the stars that you see there, the light is delayed by uh, 11 minutes, four years, 80 years, a thousand years, it, you are seeing something from back in time. In the same way with COVID, someone usually gets symptoms four to five days after they contact COVID. They usually get tested on average one to two days after they have symptoms. And then the lab takes about a day to process the results. Meaning whenever we see data on tests on the number of cases of COVID in any country anywhere, we're usually seeing a snapshot a week later. We're looking back in time one week beforehand. The situation could be much better than it is at the moment, or it could be more likely much worse. We expect most people to get COVID. We do all of these things to protect ourselves and others, to buy us time until everyone is vaccinated or we achieve herd immunity because without it, the hospitals would be overwhelmed. Remember, as St. Anthony, Dr. Fauci said, we are always six weeks away from licking this thing. Those that complain loudest and longest about the restrictions and how it hurts the economy are also tend to be those who complain most about wearing masks and social distancing. But if we were all to stay home in our country, and not go out and not interact except for the bare minimum, wearing masks and social distancing when we do, if we did it for six weeks, we'd be done. We're always six weeks away from licking this thing. We would still have to wear masks and social distancing when we go out, but we could go back to school, we could go back to work safely. If we only lock down everyone for six weeks. Some countries like South Korea, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, Australia, they've done a great job of this. Most of the world has not. I'm looking at you, America, but not you exclusively. So why do we do this? We do this so that we don't put applied too much of a burden on already burdened hospitals. Every country has a different number of intensive care beds. If 5% of your cases require intensive care and you can't provide it, most of those 5% die. It's that simple. And no country has enough intensive care beds for their population under COVID. America had a chance to increase its intensive care beds, but the leadership of the country at the time chose not to do so. We've looked at incidental deaths in the past, the overall increase in death due to COVID. Some, many of those cases who die during this time don't die from COVID directly, but they die indirectly. Consider what happens if you have a heart attack but the ambulance takes 50 minutes to get to you instead of eight minutes because there's too many COVID cases. And once you arrive, there's no ICU bed for you. You die. If we'd done the hammer of quarantine a year ago, our death rate in the United States could have been something like 4,000 cases total. The hammer and the dance refers to an idea on how to lick this thing until everyone is vaccinated or we achieve herd immunity. China some had some people going back to work two weeks after the entire country locked down. It had everyone going back to work within five weeks. How did they do this? Well, they're a dictatorship. They have stronger quarantine measures that they enforce. I had friends who were working in China still. They were limited to one person 
per household allowed to go out at a time, and only every three days could you go out to buy groceries even. And if you didn't do this, you'd go to jail. Cause it's a dictatorship. So what about the free societies? Can we do the hammer? Sure. South Korea. Very aggressive testing, high rate of testing proportionately to the population, contact tracing, so that if someone has COVID, who did they contact, who did they contact, everyone tracing it back, New Zealand's done a great job on that too, and enforcing quarantines and isolations. Whereas New Zealand never had a high number of cases, South Korea at the time, compared to other countries at the very beginning, had a higher number, and they were able to bring it down with the hammer. After this, we do the dance. In the dance, whenever R goes above 1, you do a, a aggressive lockdowns, quarantines, uh, regulations, whatever it is. R is the number of people that one person can infect. You want R to be less than 1. If R is less than 1, then every person who is sick is infecting less than one other person. Overall, for the society, that means that the disease will disappear. So, whenever, once we have the hammer of six weeks of strong quarantine, then we have every time uh, the R goes above one, we have increased regulations. When it goes down below, we have decreased. <clears throat> now, let's look specifically at social distancing. We can do this. The WHO says that most infectious people, people are most infectious about two days before they develop symptoms, and that the asymptomatic can pass on the disease. While social distancing decreases contact with members of society, it of course increases contact within your group, your family. This small but obvious fact has surprisingly profound implications on disease transmission dynamics. The basic mechanics of this mathematical principle dictate that even if there is only a little bit of additional connection between groups, like social dis dinners, play dates, unnecessary trips to the store, going to school physically, the epidemic likely won't be much different than that there was no measure in place. Any break in that chain breaks disease transmission along the chain. One quick little get-together can undermine the entire framework of a public health intervention. It is not enough to simply examine the risks associated with your behavior. You also have to look at the level of risk associated with the people you contact. Consider the people in your household and their individual risky behaviors. Here we get to play with the probabilities of just guesstimates, just a guess but estimated by a doctor uh, from where these uh, previous quotes were taken from electoralvote.com. If you're at no risk, 0%, hiding under the bed, no direct contact with anyone outside the household ever, you work from home, 100% social distancing, 0% risk. A very low risk is 5%. Really, really careful. You make sure everyone washes and changes their clothes when they come in the house. Interact with very few people, all of whom are also careful. I'm 5%. Uh, my brother-in-law, he uh, works from home. He stays at home all the time, never goes out. He's zero. Low risk. 10%. You're very careful. Trips to the grocery store. But you always wear a mask and are careful to socially distance. This would be my father-in-law, my wife, who does the grocery shopping. Moderate risk. 20%, as careful as you can be. You have a job that is not work from home and contact with people is common, or you physically go to school. High risk, 30%. It's all a hoax. You don't do anything. Now, again, quoting from a total vote, in a multi-person household, the risk quickly compounds. As an example, think of a household with two adults and two kids. Both adults are working from home. Both are very careful, very low risk. One of the children has a job outside the home, but is careful, moderate risk, and the other child only pretends to care, high risk. 
The risk of exposure is 1 minus the quantity 1 minus 0.5 times the quantity 1 minus 0.5, times the quantity 1 minus 0.2, times the quantity 1 minus 0.3, or 1 minus 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.8 times 0.7, and you're at 50%. In my household, where only two people go out regularly and only when necessary, social distancing, wearing a mask and shield, following this scenario, we're at a risk of 26%. That means that me personally, have a one in four chance, a quarter chance, of getting COVID, even though I rarely go outside the house, like one to three times a month. Just like radiation, your dosage also matters. A small or large exposure of the virus will give you the virus. But the more exposed you are, the more at risk you are of getting more of the virus. And here's where this matters. If you're healthy, your body can win the race of antibodies and white blood cells and defeat the virus before the virus defeats you. But if you're not healthy and you're exposed to more, then the virus has a leg up, a head start, and you don't. Our goal is six feet for six seconds at the grocery store. dealing with strangers. That's a hard goal to make. Enclosed spaces <clears throat> are worse. And the longer time you are with people, the higher your dosage, just like radiation. You fly in an airplane, you're exposed to radiation. Ain't no thing. Your pilot is wearing a radiation badge because she's up there maybe 200 days, 230 days out of the year. She's getting the same amount of radiation as you are in every minute she's up there, but she's up there for a lot more minutes. And at a certain point when her radiation tab reaches too high, her airline says, you can't fly anymore this year. You've reached your limit. It's too dangerous. When you are exposed to more virus, more people who have the virus, your risk increases. This is why it's so dangerous for frontline workers. When you're in an enclosed space, it's worse. And the longer time you're there, the higher the dosage. Living in an apartment building is worse. People get COVID more often in apartment buildings because that air is circulating through the indoor hallways. It's worse if you're in a gym, all that heavy breathing inside the gymnasium. Take the case of a choir in Washington in the early days of this. They were rehearsing safely with social distancing in a volleyball court. But because of the forceful exhalation of breath from all that singing, Do no no vis pachem pachem, Do no no vis pachem, Do no no vis pachem pachem, Do no no vis pachem. One asymptomatic person who didn't realize that they had COVID-19 was seeing their released viral particles. The enclosed space trapped the particles for the two and a half hours. And over four days, 45 of the 61 singers developed COVID. 60 people were in a room the size of a volleyball court. Some of them, at least, were definitely six feet away from everyone else. And yet, they still got COVID. So we now know that two meters or six feet for Americans is not enough. That was based on research in the 1800s and we've learned more about aerosols since then. We're now finding that the aerosol, which is how COVID transmits, can spread up to 26 feet or eight meters indoors. The US CDC now says 15 minutes within two meters is too much. We found that from studies. The virus doesn't care about our rules and our politics. It's trying to stay alive and eat us. Indoors, you're breathing all the same air that everyone else is. So if you must be indoors and it's not recommended, what do you do? Air conditioning with a very good filtration system. Or 
Doesn't matter how cold it is. Open up all those windows. Let the air flow through. You are not going to get a cold from cold air. That's a virus, a coronavirus, ironically, that gives you a cold. Could you get hypothermia? Yeah, if we're talking it's 20 below outside. So if it's 20 below, don't open all the windows and don't, don't go to school and work in person. The two meter rule was for outdoors and for brief interactions indoors. The bare minimum indoors is two meters when mass. Now, remember, with when all the adults getting the vaccine, this means that you, epidemiological children 16 and under, are now the ones most at risk. An MIT study in December, they calculated safe exposure times and occupancy levels for indoor spaces based on a bunch of factors like time, room size, humidity, and the behavior of those inside. In a restaurant, for example, the model projects of this study, 50 occupants would be safe for two hours, while 100 people would be safe for only 64 minutes. The amount of exposure matters. How many people you're exposed to, how long you're with them. But current general guidelines say that social distancing would fit 138 people in that space. The guidelines are not up to date. The model suggests two people will be safe for eight minutes in a mosque. 25 people would be protected for four hours. And 100 people for only two hours. Uh, I said two people would be safe for eight days, I should have said. Eight days for two people, 25 occupants for four hours, 100 people for two. Current guidelines say stay six feet apart and 52 people will be safe forever indoors. That's not right. We've got new information. The information that I'm giving is um, based on what I've been able to find. And it might not be up to date in some places. And please correct me if you see something that's not up to date, if there's, there's more information that's better. But that's how science works. Something in science is true until we get new evidence. And what we understood at the beginning of this pandemic was the best evidence we had. That's what the science was relying on. Remember, at first they were saying, there's no reason to mask in the very beginning. But we got better evidence and we realized how valuable masking was for protecting others more than yourself. So instead of one official distance, researchers now suggest a graded recommendation, depending on factors, including whether someone is singing or talking or breathing heavily, or indoors, or outdoors. Now let's turn to masks. Masks protect you. They protect others more. The most effective at keeping the particles from getting out into the world, the most effective thing, is wearing a mask. Asymptomatic people who have COVID are less likely to spread if you're wearing a mask. That's why we all wear masks, even though we probably don't have COVID or we don't think we do because you're asymptomatic, you don't know. Remember the previous statistic I showed you that one third of people who are asymptomatic, one third of people who have COVID are asymptomatic, one third. Of the groups of mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, and serious symptoms, the biggest group is neither of those three, it's the asymptomatic. Asymptomatic people are less likely to spread it if they're wearing a mask. And without a mask, the two meter rule or more doesn't work. You can go to a party for an hour and be socially distanced two and a half meters with masks and sing and shout. If you remove the mask and continue to social distance outside, you could still safely go to the party, but stop singing and shouting. 
Masks reduce the severity of infection a lot as well. And it's about exposure duration, like I said. No matter the quality, it will filter out the majority of particles, no matter your mask quality. Masks help, and they reduce the severity in studies. Cultures that normally mask up, mostly in East Asia, have far fewer cases and less severe cases among those that get it. Masks help. They reduce the exposure to the virus particles. Which mask? The N95 is the best, but without the vent. If you have the vent, then you need to put a tab over the nose because you will be rebreathing the particles out. You will be protected, but you will be breathing particles out and other people will be exposed. After the N95, a surgical mask. After the surgical mask, anything else. But any kind of mask will substantially help. Doubling the mask is even better. And children, two and above, are recommended by pediatricians to wear masks. My son Darwin wears a mask. Shields. I don't know why there are so many countries that are not putting a shield requirement in. I'm happy that my country in the Philippines here, shields are required because they protect you better. It's like seat belts and, motor and motorcycle helmets. They, we wear seat belts uh, and motorcycle helmets to protect the wearer. But seat belts also protect you from impaling other people with your body. A shield is your motorcycle helmet. It will protect the wearer. But it is not a replacement for a mask. Wear both. The viral particles can come up underneath the shield. But the particles go onto the shield surface instead of on the mask surface. And it makes you touch your face less. Which means you don't transfer viral particles from surfaces to your nose, mouth, eyes. You also don't accidentally uh, stab yourself in the eye, because that happens a lot. Groceries. We're now saying that we know the virus is more from aerosol than touching disinfected, uh, than touch. Disinfecting every last item is no longer considered necessary. For instance, uh, my mom got me a UV light. We run it, um, we run it over the groceries. It will kill uh, grocery, any surface, to kill all the bacteria if you hold it there for 10 seconds. We don't do that. We just run it lightly over the groceries as a precaution. We take a shower and we um, we uh, soap up and everything when we come home every time. We just wand the groceries briefly. We don't use disinfecting spray as that would contaminate the food through the package. So you don't use a spray on the package because a lot of packages are designed for those disinfectant sprays and you will then um, get that going through into the food. If you want to clean your groceries still, use soap and water. And on your vegetables, your fresh food, don't use soap, use just water because soap can give you diarrhea. And you can just use a UV light, uh, run it on, run it over. But what should you do for grocery shopping? These are the important things. Avoid crowds, shop quickly. Wear a mask and shield. Go alone, not with other people from your family. Sanitize the cart in hands. That grocery cart before COVID has more bacteria and viruses on it than on a toilet seat. If you're going to touch a grocery cart with your hands, even without COVID, then please, the next time you go into a public restroom, 
Also put your hands on the grocery, on the toilet seat. When you go grocery shopping, sanitize the cart with a little bit of alcohol on a wet wipe. Do not wear gloves. Why? And the cashier is stressed out. He's got to deal with so much. Give him space. He's exposed, duration of exposure, remember, to many people throughout the day. He's on a high-risk job. Give him space. Be nice. And if you can, use no-touch payment, like a card or a phone, if you're one of the advanced countries that uses, allows for phone payment. Now we turn to herd immunity. What is herd immunity? Is it like an elephant herd protecting from lions? To achieve herd immunity, we need somewhere between 50 to 70% exposure. Either people who are exposed to COVID and get COVID, whether or not they get symptoms, or the vaccine. We think. We're still not sure. But we think it's 50 to 70% exposure. There are some indications that people who develop mild to moderate symptoms do not get natural immunity. But the good news is that research indicates that antibodies are long-lasting. Now, antibodies are, I talked to you about them before, they're only part of your immune response. You also have memory B cells and T cells that help kill the invaders. One part of that, in some studies, show that the antibodies are long-lasting, and you will be more protected uh, than we, long, for longer than we thought. That's the good news. We need to achieve herd immunity by having lots of people be exposed and lots of people die, or just possibly this is better, having as many people as possible get the vaccine. Remember, there are some people who are allergic to vaccines, some people who a very small number who would have a negative reaction to the vaccine. And children, epidemiologically, those under 16, cannot yet get the vaccine. So even if the rest of us do, and they can't, there can be reservoirs of the virus that remain in those populations, which leads to repeat flare-ups throughout the world until the younger people can get the vaccine. Which means that in order to protect us all, Everyone who can get the vaccine needs to. And that's what we'll be talking about in a future lecture.